Welcome to the Safety Doc Podcast with your charismatic host and prominent safety expert, Dr. David Perotin. Be entertained and informed as the Safety Doc discusses both best and bizarre practices in safety preparation and crisis response. The truth will keep you safe. Follow Dr. Perotin on Twitter at SafetyPhD. Hi, everybody. This is David, and welcome to the Safety Doc Podcast. So we have a great podcast in store for you today, podcast number 37. And uh, we're going to change things up a little bit today. About halfway through, going to take about a minute break and just do a little bit of um, some obscure trivia, you know, just to change the pace up a little bit and then get right back into it. So... um, Right now, I have a defoliated birch tree in my backyard. It's big. It's been there a long time, and it was consumed by Japanese beetles. So I was outside the other day and looked down a few houses, and one of my neighbors was out on his roof spraying um, with a garden hose and then some kind of container hooked up to it was spraying his birch tree. So, you know, of course... Curious, I went down and said, hey, Matt, what's going on? And he said, oh, don't go anywhere near here. And um, and what was happening is these Japanese beetles, which are, are um, kind of have a shiny metallic uh, green um, shell to them, um, you know, maybe about a quarter of an inch long, um, they were falling from the tree. And literally, it was next to his driveway, just covered his driveway. I mean, it, it was insane. And... Uh, so, you know, he's, he's got some insecticide going on. He's like, yeah, these things are just, they're, they're just wild. And uh, he goes, you have a birch tree, don't you? I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, I do, you know. So I go in my backyard, and they're just swarming this thing. And, and leaves are falling down on me as I'm, like, underneath this. And my tree is taller than his, and there's no way I can, you know, unless I, I have a ladder truck from the fire department, I'm not able to get to the top of this thing and spray it down. So uh talk to the uh, tree guy about what could be done and, and not really a whole lot. So um, I don't think that tree is going to be around um, after this fall. But then I have a maple tree in, in the front, and, and I'm reading, I'm researching about these Japanese beetles. And the 300 trees and shrubs and whatever that they go after. And apparently, they don't have any natural um, enemies in in the United States. Have been here since I don't know, roughly 1920 or something. Um, and and anyway, um, my my maple tree started to be attacked. So I do have uh, the tree guy is coming tomorrow. That is a uh, that's not quite as tall in the front. Uh, I planted that when we moved here. Um, 15 years ago, nice tree, just had it shaped in, in spring, uh, by the, the tree guy pruned it all up and I'm like, nope, we're going to war on this one. It's, uh, it's me against Japanese beetles and apparently they will be around for about a month yet and then they, they take off. But, uh, it looks like it's going to be an annual occurrence that once they settle in your area, that's, that's just kind of the way things are. So Oh, my goodness. Um, thankfully, my other trees really aren't uh, susceptible, at least to this point. But it's it's just crazy. It is just crazy. So um, something funny happened, folks. Um, we have uh, – we attended the library book sale yesterday. Very nice library in our town. And every year they do a, a book sale. And if you're a member of the library um, supporters or whatever it's called – uh, friends of library, you get to go the night before, uh, kind of this secret pass, and you get to go in and, and, and purchase from this book sale. And I do have a few books, and there's a couple in the background there um, that I, I purchased. And, you know, the, it's really cheap. I mean, you, you go in with like a sack, like a cloth sack you take to a grocery store, and you fill up with groceries and stuff like that. And you can fill it up, you know, basically to the top of books, and it's like 15 bucks or something like that. Um, so anyway, though, I, I was going through and I found a book, uh, research, uh, statistics book. I'm looking at this thing. I'm like, wow, this, it, it, it seemed a little bit familiar to me. Um, a, just some, just some sixth sense type of thing going on. I'm like, wow, this is really an awesome book. Uh, I'm going to buy it. So I put it in, got it home, opened it up, saw some markings in it and realized it was a book I donated 
one year ago to the library. <laughs> so I bought my own book back. Um, I don't know what to say, folks. Uh, so, yeah, maybe, you know, the second time around, even better for a book that I had read, used, parted with, um, and now it will be donated again to the library. But, yeah, I bought my own book back. Um, and once I could see some of the markings inside of it, I was like, ah, yes, I know why this book was calling to me. So, um, anyway, <laughs> just funny. I can't, I can't. I, I can't believe I did that. I can't believe, absolutely can't believe that I did that. So um, today, hey, we're going to be talking about why we can't compare disasters, uh, such as the World Trade Center, uh, the Murrah Building, Katrina, and more. Why we can't compare these. So not that comparisons aren't done. Why we should not do these. Why this does not help inform practice. And I'm, I'm going to give a few examples some few, um, what I would say, constructs or contextual frameworks we're going to work within to really point out why it's, it doesn't make sense to do that. Um, you're not going to gain a lot. And right now we have um, the movie Dunkirk is hitting theater. So it looks to be a great movie. It has terrific reviews. But what that is doing is bringing forward uh, comparisons of Dunkirk and the 9-11 attacks on the Twin Towers. So Dunkirk was 1940, Twin Towers 2001. Um, even a, a book, you know, American Dunkirk has come out, and I, which I have, um, which w which looks at the 9-11 rescue um, and, and does comparisons um, and parallels to, to the Dunkirk rescue. But... Um, I'm not, I'm not really a fan of doing that. So, um, I'm going to, I'm going to get into how I think that actually sets us back. I do have a question that was, uh, submitted for the show, um, from Matt and Phil, and I'm just going to click over here from, um, dun, 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 dun. semi-intellectual musings from the semi-intellectual musings podcast, um, Matt and Phil had submitted a question to me. Um, the question, how have how, how have chief resilience officers adapted their work to various kinds of disasters slash hazards, either following event or in anticipation? So I'm going to take a stab at responding uh, to that question uh, later on in today's podcast. Again, how have chief resilience officers adapted their work to various kinds of disasters slash hazards, either following an event or in, ten, in anticipation? So um, a, a shout out to the Readily Random podcast, uh, readilyrandom.com. Uh, Larry Roberts, another exceptional guest uh, on a recent show, Joe Navarro um, and looking uh, through his his book uh, three three minutes uh, three minutes to doomsday um, and and you, folks you just need to to listen to it um, Joe uh, former I believe F FBI agent I want to say FBI I, I don't have it up in front of me I don't think it was it, it was CIA. I believe it was FBI um, but I listened to I listened to that podcast two times um, enjoyed it uh, equally uh, as much the second time as the first, but uh, check out readilyrandom.com. It's interview uh, number 16, Joe Navarro. Um, and, and Joe is just so, so modest, and these stories are so rich. Um, and, and Larry does a wonderful job uh, bringing, um, you know, bringing that discussion, um, carrying that discussion uh, forward. So, Wow, I, I never realized. You don't, you know, you, you don't hear about these things like how close we were to a conflict, you know, with the Soviet Union or East and West and things like that. And and Joel points out something like that I never heard about, and, and I've researched quite a bit of this. Um, and, and just his experiences, you know, working with the FBI and be, being recruited early on and, and stuff like that is just fascinating. But anyway, readilyrandom dot com always always top notch. Uh, check out awarenesspodcast dot com. This is new. Folks, awarenesspodcast.com. Um, it comes from um, uh, Hector Solis and the Dads at Typical Daddy podcast. So it, it's it's um, broader it, it, as far as taking on um, a number of topics, uh, which will be submitted um, by um, by you, 
by me, by people who are curious um, in, in having questions answered about um, um, more like social science type questions. You know, a typical daddy uh, has a lot to do with, with understanding parenting, especially from a father's uh, perspective. But check out awarenesspodcast.com and expect a brilliantly produced podcast by Hector Solis and the dads. I know Hector uh, invested in some new equipment recently. Um, he is, you know, so detailed in making sure that the show is very tight, um, tightly produced uh, to uh, technical standards and then also with the questions that he's asking the answers that he that he's seeking, um, the discussion that he hopes to develop. So check it out, awarenesspodcast.com. You're going to see me promote that on Twitter uh, just because, hey, it, 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 it's going to be great. And and this is what we need. Um, we need more podcasts that, uh, that allow people to um, put questions out there that until, you know, they do that and, and all of a sudden other people are like, yeah, I've got the same question. I've got the same question about this. Or what, it, what is it like to raise a, uh, you know, a, a teenager in this environment of, of social media or, you know, what's it like to have, you know, whatever, whatever. Let, let, let's get these topics out there. Awarenesspodcast.com. Check it out. Thank you to the 405 Media. Um, you can check out the405media.com. It is basically a podcasting equivalent to a radio station. It is the League of Extraordinary Podcasters. Uh, John Grant uh, and, and company do a phenomenal job always uh, producing a 24-hour lineup of just awesome, awesome podcast culture, politics, uh, just so much more. Listen to the Safety Doc every day, 2 p.m. PST Daily on the405media.com. I've actually done a lot of work in getting this on Blueberry, um, you know, on Stitcher and, and getting out, getting the show so you can access it in a number of, of ways also. But if you do go to the405media.com, the cool thing about that is you can see my narratives. I do blog posts uh, for every podcast. And right there, if you just click and, and, and find the Safety Doc podcast, you can bring up every narrative that I've ever produced where you don't have that so much in the other mediums. You know, when you go into SoundCloud and that, you know, they're, they're shorter. They're, they're much more in depth on the 405 Media. So this show is on YouTube. Hey, yeah, you can watch right now on YouTube. Um, and I do try to overlay, you know, graphics um, to, to help uh, build you know, the topic that I'm talking about. Um, and for some reason, you know, we didn't have a lot of people watch, like episode 36. I, I'm like, I don't know what it was. If I just didn't hashtag it out right. Um, I think I, you know, I even wore a new shirt for that one. Come on, folks. Uh, I don't know what it was, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have a rebound from that. Everything was great on audio. You know, good, all the numbers good. But show is out there on YouTube, you know, for those of you that want to um, watch in, in person, you know, get to see me put the show together so i also get to see the great signs in the back from our show supporters um so please continue con consider subscribing on youtube you can go into apple podcast uh you can go to soundcloud stitcher blueberry a number of ways that you can find the safety doc podcast or if you search uh, david Perodin, uh you'll find you know find that also you just go into um Twitter at safety PhD at safety PhD. You can, you know, find out where you can access my podcast. So we are approaching 1000 Twitter followers. Uh, so that is, that's terrific. Um, we also have a brand new logo for the safety doc podcast. So we're, we've updated our branding. The logo um, has the rollout started today. And thank you to Larry Roberts of Readily Random in helping to make that possible. So um, you're going to see a completely kind of different color scheme. Um, I had kind of the, the light blue working and, you know, the image of me somewhat, you know. Um, and and now we're going with, with more of the yellows and, and oranges and, and blacks that are associated with, with safety and, and to really make that logo pop and stand out, which which it certainly uh, does. So if you go into um, Apple Podcasts and, and search for the Safety Doc Podcast, you're going to immediately see a, a, a logo that's going to look like nothing else out there. It's really awesome. 
Uh, so I've been working on my my book, uh, Lessons of Lore Manhattan. I have a publishing contract with uh, Roman and Littlefield uh, Publishing House. So, you know, it's involved a lot of um, timelining of societal context about the perceptions of America, communism, Russia, um, the government, uh, military, and the media from like 1975 to 1995. So kind of kind of very unique in going in and, and trying to frame out what things were like for, for someone who was growing up during that time, someone who might have been, um, you know, in their teens and, and, you know, 20s or, or um, you know, kind of getting out in the workforce, getting established, uh, maybe starting a family. What, what was that context really like? Because I think that's really important in helping us to understand Lessons of Lore Manhattan is about the 9-11, um, 2001 boat rescue of 500,000 people in nine hours. So I'm a big believer in studying events, sentinel events like that, very uh, with, with great depth as their own unit and not comparing them to other events because I don't, I don't, I don't believe you can really do that with, with much, with much validity. And I'll talk about the reason, the reasons for that, a couple of reasons for that. But, um, but we're looking at something called transference or basically like the way you were raised. Um, so at nine 11, we know the average, the average person rescued was about 40 years old, worked in finance, um, so born around 1960, what were some of the things that they were experiencing? Um, and very, very fascinating stuff, folks, that I've, that I've been finding out. And this is where people haven't gone. You know, people people tend to compare, um, you know, compare the rescue to other rescues like Dunkirk and things like that. But I actually want to learn about, um, you know, this, this, this typical 40-year-old person. What did they experience like growing up? Um, that shaped them so when this rescue happened that they participated in it, there wasn't this mob mentality and this craziness and all of that. Um, why did it work so well? So, and as I say that, I'm going to click off autofocus and move us over here to manual focus. And now, I'm, hey, focus. We're focused. Folks, we're focused. Um, let me throw a few things out there. Let's look between 1980 and 1985. And I think this is very helpful because um, – how often is it when we study something, we don't understand the context which brought people like to that point in time? You know, like what, what formed their opinions, their biases, the way that they perceive things? What, you know, it's always a question of, of in, in the court of law, if something happens, it'll be like, well, what brought this person to the point where, you know, now they, they are before us, before, a, for, you know, armed robbery or something like that? What happened early on in their life? Um, and you can look at it both ways, you know, or, or what, what, you know, this person who is, is, um, you know, doing all of these, these, you know, great, uh, humanitarian efforts or things like that. Like what, ha what happened early on in their life to kind of shape them to, to come to the point that they're at now. And you can look at groups of, of, of people in, in those contexts. So anyway, let, let's, we already said the typical person. 500,000 people rescued by boat from lower Manhattan, typical person, 40 years old, worked in finance. So if for that to, we, we reverse that, that person, let's say born 1960. Okay. So let's project this ahead. So when they would have been, you know, young, I mean, when do you start to realize kind of what your political views are? I mean, maybe when you're, you know, Starting, you know, elections, you get educated, um, you know, 12, 13, 14. And it, it's most likely what your parents have gone through. Um, you know, like, so parents that have gone, the parents of, of these 9-11 rescuees, or I call them recipients of the rescue, they would have, the parents would have been through the Cuban Missile Crisis, would have been through the Vietnam War. So would have, especially with the Cuban Missile Crisis, would have definitely had, um, an inculcation that we have to, as the United States, be, um, you know, invest in a strong military, be very vigilant against the Eastern Bloc and the Soviet Union. Um, so it was really this East versus West. So as a kid, that's the kind of thing you're probably going to hear from, from your, your parents. I mean, if you're born in 1960. Now, so, so let's say, you know, you're, you're 20 years old, you know, you're in college. What happens? Okay. So 1980, CNN. CNN 24 hour news network begins. And, uh, before that you didn't have 24 hour news. I mean, if you, you could have some breaking 
news that would come in, and that certainly did um, through the traditional um, stations that were out there. But um, even even a lot of that was was really not timely, um, and, and there wasn't much of it. So I mean, you get your your evening news and things like that. But CNN was, you know, introduced this, this twenty four hour news, and they had a hard time filling these slots and things like that. But one of the things they started to do is to show like what was going on more with video that they could obtain from you know um, Soviet Union. Uh, parades, you know, where you'd have military uh, vehicles, you know, pulling, you know, ballistic missiles, things that would be happening in communist countries, um, just, you know, disasters worldwide, worldwide strife. And there was a moniker, it's called the Crisis News Network for a while. But what happened all of a sudden, imagine you're 20 years old and, and, and now you you are getting inundated. Um, you're, you're not just getting this injection of the six o'clock news between sports and weather and all of that. Oh yeah, this happened, you know, in, in whatever, or you're reading it in the monthly, you know, edition of time or Newsweek or whatever's coming out. Um, or, you know, some, something on page three of the paper. Uh, no, it's, it's, it's very, it, it becomes very much in front of you. Uh, we start to see cable, it, you know, cable TV starts to come in. I remember, I think it was, Boy, oh boy, that'd be like 83, maybe, right around then. We got cable television in our hometown. I remember this. It was big news. And uh, and so my parents subscribed to, like, the full package. You know, that was the thing where they they did that, you know, back when cable started. Um, it w- would come to your town. It was this big thing, and they would give you, a, you know, HBO Cinema, Cinemax or whatever, and, and the whole deal. Uh, I remember that HBO intro. You can Google it. I think it was from like 1983, 84, and and they actually did this miniature town, and then they had this, they they filmed it, um, and and this camera would move. I don't know, like a millimeter, a second or something like that, would pan along, and then eventually it it panned upward, and then they they did some graphics that were done with um. What was it? Um, fiber optics, different colored lights and stuff. And I mean, it's just crazy. So anyway, if you, if you Google it, it's just amazing. Today you could you could do the thing with, you know, a typical $40 software program and probably, you know, like half an hour. But um, it was it was amazing for the time. But any, anyway, so so you, you get this. You, you, you get all this. This, this stuff is, is right there. I mean, it's, it's coming to you. 1981, the space shuttle, um, you know, the space shuttles, uh, Columbia's launched. And uh, Russia countered with its own shuttle because um, Russia was fearing that the United States was going to weaponize the space shuttle. So that that was that was very that was very evident in the belief of the Soviet Union. And and so the U.S. is flexing military power again. If you're watching this, it's like wow, you know, look what we can do. Um, and and suddenly we have the shuttle that can you know go out to space and things like that. Um, the Soviets countered. Um, uh, you know, later in the 80s, it was, it was in 88, it was it, Buran, B-U-R-A-N, which means snowstorm or blizzard. Um, it, it was basically, it looked like the space shuttle design of the United States. Um, the Buran made uh, one unmanned flight in 1988. In 2002, it was destroyed, the hangar. It was in um, collapsed. Um, but, yeah, it, it was really something because it, it was in 1981, you know, so we have the space shuttle. I mean, everybody watches that on TV, and it's this whole thing. And then what happens, um, some things build upon that. So in 83, again, you know, these people who are rescued, they are in their 20s. They're, they're still very formative. They're, they're, they're seeing there's very much a trust in, in that the government is there to defend the United States, defend its citizens against this threat heavy during the Cold War of the Soviet Union. Um, you know, and, and we have Ronald you know, Reagan as, as president. So we have, you know, this, this acceleration going on in, in, you know, defense spending 1983, the movie, the day after, uh, comes out a hundred million people watch that still terrifying to this day. You can find clips of it on YouTube, uh, uh, basically, um, was, it was an ABC. So it showed on, on, you know, ABC, it was, um, an all out, pretty much nuclear war, uh, ICBM exchange between the, the U S and the Soviet union and, and just terrifying, terrifying to watch, um, how that was done. And I said a hundred million people had watched that. 
So it, if you didn't watch it, you definitely had heard about it back then. So again, you have these people who are looking at um, wanting, you know, to get out in the workforce, getting to start families, and now you have something like this that that they watch. Again, it's this this trust that you have to you know put forward in the government of, I you know I trust the military, I trust the government because this this the Soviet Union is could do this at any moment. So yes, I trust. I trust that the government is there to protect me and the military is there to protect me against what's portrayed in this, this day after. Um, and then what happens also in 1983, Ronald Reagan comes out with the Strategic Defense Initiative, Star Wars, okay, SDI, Star Wars. Um, and, and that really, you know, accelerated the concern in the Soviet Union that all of a sudden we have um, – that in, instead of mutually assured destruction, okay, which had been kind of the the, the protocol um, of that that was a deterrent for war, is you know if the U.S. attacked Russia, Russia would attack the U.S. and it would be something like the day after both both countries you know would, would basically be annihilated. Um, and and Ronald Reagan comes out in, with the SDI, and, and you know, again you can you can go in and find um, through Google searches like the articles that were in newspapers, which, which would show you know these satellites that, that could shoot you know laser beams and knock out um, Soviet ICBMs or Eastern Bloc ICBMs before they would even you know get into the atmosphere. Um, so of course uh, you know that you know that raises anxiety. It changes from again this mutually assured destructive. Um, mad to first strike. The U.S. now has the ability to first strike, and and it also poses that the U.S. is doing this because it anticipates maybe that the Soviets are going to consider a first strike, um, you know, position, and and so it's freaky. It starts to work its way into pop culture. So 1984, Nana, the song 99 Red Balloons. Uh, it's an anti-war protest song. It's against NATO, their nuclear missile deployments. Um, and in 1985, uh, Sting, the song Russians, and there is a, it's a really haunting melody. And there is a there is a, a line in there, I hope the Russians love their children too. I actually had the cassette tape, and I remember playing that song a number of times. So let's see, 85, uh, when that came out, I had been 13, going on 14, and I remember it freaked me out. I was like 13, and I'm listening to this song, and I'm just, terrified like thinking oh my goodness you know of of just again what i had what what my image was of the soviet union and then of course hoping you know that our military that our leaders um would do everything they could to protect us um and, and, and you know what was war really imminent and and what would this be like it was around the same time we had a um, we had a new fire siren um, or tornado siren or whatever air raid siren would call it. But um, I lived in a small town, you know, less than two thousand people, and they put in this new siren. Um, and I remember in the mail, everyone in the community received um, like it was a kind of like a postcard, and it said, "Please, you know, tape this up somewhere." And it had three things on it, and one was. This is what the siren will sound like if it's being activated for a fire call. Because back then, that was before the days of pagers and things like that. So when they would do, well, I think they had pagers, but when, whenever there was a fire, they would do the fire siren um, in addition to, to the paging of the firefighters. So um, it, it might go, you know, up and down slowly like eight times or something like that. And then that would indicate that there was, that was, alerting that there was a fire. Um, and then they had that it would just be continuous if it was a severe weather event. And then there was a third part on there, and it showed this wave, okay? It showed this this real fast wave of, you know, the, of, of um, you know, the siren going up and down and up and down. Um, and they said, this is for hostile military conflict. And my parents... Uh, taped that inside of a cupboard door um so that that card and i'll never forget like when i saw that you know that 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 pattern in in hostile military action i was like oh my goodness like um 
you know, that, that, and in the house we lived in, it had a, a bomb shelter in the basement, you know, it was built in the sixties and it had like 16 inches of reinforced concrete, like a ceiling and all of that. I mean, we actually lived in a house that had a bomb shelter intentionally built in it. So, you know, I, I just remember how much that affected me. Um, and again, the psychology of, of hoping um, that the military and, and anything I could do, you know, there's not much you can do when you're 13 or 14, but certainly, um, you know, you, uh, you support it. Um, you know, the, the government, the president and, and whatever was being done didn't mean much, I guess, when you didn't have a vote and things like that. But, um, I, I remember being very cognizant and, and just, um, I, I don't know. I mean, scared and also um, very thankful that we had a military and whatever our military needed to do to keep us safe. Hey, I was I was fine with that. Um, so, yeah, pretty, you know, undeveloped, you know, th thought processes, you know, couldn't get into a lot of deep reasoning of that, but still very visceral feelings. To I mean, I talk about to this day. I can remember where that card was in, in the fact that, you know, it the, the actual... Um, cabinet, you know, and you open it up and that, that, that wavy, that fast, you know, wavy, the, those, those close sinusoidal, you know, up and down in, in hostile military action. Um, wow. So, um, you know what, folks? Right there is a great time to take a break. Dun, 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 dun. It's break time. All right. Let's lighten things up a little bit. Okay. We are going to talk here quickly. A couple. Just obscure pieces of knowledge. Um, guess what? 8% of pet owners dress up their dogs and cats for Halloween. Uh, Non-dairy creamer is flammable. Average life expectancy worldwide is 66 years. Hey, it's looking it up in the, in the U.S. in 1800. It's 40 years. In ancient Greece, um, sick people slept in medicine temples to dream about how to get better. What crime led to Billy the Kid's first in run in with the law? Hey, he was stealing butter. And what does the word pizza mean in Italian? It means a pie. So, yeah. Da, 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 pizza pie. Okay, hey, why can't we compare disasters? Again, we can. It's more like, why shouldn't we do this? Why why is this not good research? And I say this as I have two research books to the right of me of and, and studies from very reputable disaster experts. But you know what? I, I, I just think there's a different way to go about this, folks, and I'm going to talk about it right now. Um, there are many reasons why um, disasters should be um, studied as a specific unit. Um Instead of like comparing this disaster to this disaster to this, that you know, that each disaster is its own unit. It needs to go very, very in depth into that unit. Um, so today I'm going to focus on two of the more significant reasons: communications and geography. So communications and geography. There's many areas where we could break this down, but let's look at communications and geography. Some interesting points here. I've already touched upon demography in my discussion about the lived experiences of people rescued from Lower Manhattan. So remember, we we're talking about like just a second ago. Um, 1980 to 1985, all of those things that were happening, um, kind of culturally and, you know, from the space shuttle to the movie the day after to the, to the song 99 Red Balloons by Nina. And, and so what, you know, people, this transference of like just this, this fear. And so when you did see a government rescue, when you did see Coast Guard ships, when you did see, um, um, fireboats in the harbor, the transference of we've been attacked and this is this is a military led coordinated effort. I'm transferring my trust into this because when I was raised, that's what I was told to do. And as soon as you transfer that trust in, then it's much easier to go along with that rescue. Okay? That's that's my point here. So Context, situations, and timestamps. You cannot reproduce context and situation, and everything is timestamped. So something that happened last week versus something that happens today. If we look at the context, you might say, well, that's pretty close in time. 
Um, and yeah, it is. I mean, so things that are closer in time are more similar. They're not the same. But, you know, maybe if we start breaking down the context of, of what was the, the weather, what was the time of day, what was the location, um, the availability of resources, when they arrive, we start time stamping things. Was there anything else going on, um, you know, with people? Like an interesting thing, you know, most people don't know is, you know, there was, there was an election going on um, in New York. Um, people are going to deploying places on 9-11, so. But anyway, it was Tuesday, it's election day. Um, but anyway, um, these context situations and timestamps, that's why Dunkirk, for example, trying to compare Dunkirk to, um, to, to the World Trade Center attack 61 years later, um, yeah, such a different context, such a different situation, you know, and different, different timestamp, you know. Um, let's talk about, I have two. I have two areas which which I think will shed light on this: communication and access to information. So, looking at research studies, they're fa they're fairly similar, actually, folks. If you if you go in and you, and you study disasters, um, World Trade Center, Mura, um, building Oklahoma City, wildfires, the Man Gulch uh, wildfire, um, various hurricanes, Hurricane Katrina, for example, and 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 so forth. You kind of come up with some consistent findings. One of those is that um, communication breakdowns and people and responders with lack of access to information or else like too many people involved um, in the instant command system where then information coming in um, was coming in from too many sources and, and was hard to, to make sense of. So that's kind of a big thing or, or just like a complete flat out like lack of communication or communication collapse. So, um, but th the reality, folks, is that that's that's not really on the table um, as much anymore as it was even a few years ago. And think about this, the growth of the Internet. So Bill Clinton, quote from Bill Clinton, he said, when I took office, only high energy physicists had ever heard of what is called the World Wide Web. Now even my cat has its own page, Bill Clinton. So, um, you know, that was back when, again, when he took office. Only 16 million people or 0.4% of, in the entire world of world users had, um, X, you know, uh, only 16 million people in the world were regularly using the internet in 1995. 1995. Okay, 1995 was the year of the Murrah um, building bombing in Oklahoma City. So again, you're looking at 0.4% um, of people in the world having access, 60 million. So really, the internet's a non-factor at that point. Um, and August 2001, okay, August of 2001, so right before the 9-11 attacks, 513 million people around the world were regular users of the internet, which was 9%. So we have this jump from 16 million to 513. So 9-11, um, I learned about 9-11 through Yahoo, through being online and, and Yahoo News. I learned about the Murrah building attack um, from TV. So again, we have this evolution of now things are available on the web, more people can get information. It can be more quickly accessed. There are various sources you can go to. You're not locate. You're not tied into whatever you can pick up on the rabbit ears on um, your antenna back in 19, you know, 90, 95 or you know the the media stations, you know, which might be covering this. You, know, you have so many more sources that you can go to. Now let, let's fast forward this to, to March of 2017. The most current data: uh, 3.74 billion or 50 percent of the world is regularly using the internet. Now this is interesting considering like over a billion people don't even have access to electricity. But um, let's think about this though, okay? So people are, you read studies after study and, 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 and they talk about, you know, communication breakdown in, in Mura, communication breakdown, you know, it, it was better, but there was some communication uh, breakdown at the you know, World Trade Center rescue. Um, but the, 
reality is we're getting much better with our communication networks. And right now, in talking with ISS 24-7, the folks that do instant command or instant management um, work for, like, the National Football League, NCAA arenas, very dense population areas, they're saying, you know what? Like, the systems out there today are very robust. Even when hurricanes uh, come through areas uh, in the United States, you know, in the coastal areas, typically you can still use the text messaging systems. Those, those aren't wiped out. And we're getting more and more redundancy in these systems and more access to satellite and, and things like that where, um, you know, the analog systems that would have been in place, the analog communications at limited distance and, and, and stuff like that, um, and, and limited, you know, information sharing that was available in 95 with the Mercy, you know, that evolved greatly in 2001 when you had this mix kind of analog and digital at the time of the World Trade Center. There was a lot of um, afterwards, you know, follow-ups on, on the radios uh, that that were used, like the two-way communications. They were kind of making a transition into more of a modern um, digital at that time. So you did have systems that, that were not fully compatible. Um but right now, you know, we've got pretty good systems out there. And so, you know, just the history of the Internet. So in six, 1961, uh, Leonard uh, Kleinrock of MIT um, produced his work on packet switching theory, basically saying this was possible. And 1984, domain name system came out. The DNS was introduced. So I have a website, safetyphd.com. So, you know, registered it with the DNS. That was in 84 um, that, that came out. So, you know, we, we, we kind of think these things have been around a lot, but they haven't. So what's the point I'm, I'm getting at here? The point is, um, when we think of disasters and communication, we need to look to what, it, what the future is going to be. We're not going to have, we're likely going to have um, a, a pretty solid uh, communication system. Uh, it, we did at the uh, Boston um, Marathon bombing, you know, with all of the, the cell phones being used in that, the, the, the towers were able to, to handle that. Um, and again, we're getting into this this area where information is very ubiqu ubiquitous and people can go and and do like periscoping with YouTube. For example, if there's a, an event going on, they can actually like broadcast it live. Like I could do it if something was happening here um, and get information out. So we we have ability to get information out. And that's probably one of the biggest things in coordinated disasters. It's twofold. One is the rescuers that they get information. Part of that comes from their their radio communications with with each other. Um, but then it's the people affected, the families, like at nine eleven, the five hundred thousand people waiting for the boat rescue. Um, you know, they didn't have their smartphones, but yet en enough of them were getting text and and getting you know from people who were logging into the internet and, and were aware of what was happening and that information then was filtering through the crowds but today if something like that you know happened the likelihood is you know you'd be able to access information on what was going on um, and that's only going to get better so as we look to rescue and we point out like well we need better you know the communication systems have failed us and people aren't informed and whatever well i'm saying in the united states uh, I, I don't think that's going to be as 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 big of an issue going forward. Um, I, I I really don't. Um, so when we take studies and we compare back to th you know things like like the Dunkirk um, rescue, and, and I'll get into another reason why I don't I, I don't think that's a good comparison at all. It's a comparison that's made because there were you know what like I don't know three hundred thousand people roughly at Dunkirk in nine days and there were civilian craft involved and things like that. But the 9-11 rescue, you know, the boat rescue um, was within nine hours and it was 500,000 people. And again, it was this different level of communications and it was not as much of, of this, this kind of civilian rescue as it's been portrayed. I mean, 37% of the boats involved were tugs, um, very highly trained to be in order to be on a tug crew, you have to, you had to pass, um, a, you know, a Coast Guard test. People were taking classes. There was a lot of distributed leadership, meaning you know, captains were in their positions a long time. They knew their tools. For example, the boats, you know, saltwater were lasting 30, 40, 50 years. These 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 tugboats. So it's not like um, it, it it some portray this as this this affiliation of anyone that had a boat getting together. 
Um, and while there were people that responded that had, you know, fishing boats or leisure boats or things like that to aid, the bulk, you know, was definitely a very, very trained, cohesive group that had worked together. Like the Sandy Hook pilots had served the harbor for 300 years. McAllister tugboats had been there 150 years. So, yeah, again, you, you had people and equipment, you know, very used to, to this this harbor. Um, so anyway, yeah, communi so communication, though, um, I, I just don't think it's going to be as big of an issue going forward. Um, and I, so, you know, we talked about the, the internet and if we, if we think back right now to the Murrah city or, or, or the Murrah building bombing in 1995. So, you know, 1995, I had an Apple two E computer. We didn't have internet access at our apartment. My roommates and I was in college, I was in grad school. Um, and I remember one of my roommates, Nate, would leave at night and walk over to one of the computer labs and he would email a friend at a different university. And, and I was just amazed. I'm like, what is this email about? What are you doing here? Like, I didn't even know, like I, I had never sent an email until I think it was, you know, at least probably a year after I think I, I had sent my first email in 96. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, we, we look back and we don't realize how far we've come in communications and how much knowledge is out there and it's ubiquitous and how we can become informed. So I, I don't, I don't think it's an issue so much of, of being deprived of, of knowledge um, in, as that afflicted early rescues and especially people who were um, being rescued. Um, I, I, I think we are in a completely different area today. So, um, again, to compare even 95, the, the Murrah building in, to 2001 from a communication and access to information standpoint, people had much more access just in six years. Again, you went from 60 million people to 513 million people. Um, I remember, you know, I had a, in 2001, I had a, I had a cell phone. I, I, again, I learned about the disaster or, or the World Trade Center attacks um, at my desk. Um, I happened to have, you know, Yahoo News up that morning and it came across and I remember getting information that way. So, um, and, and, you know, analog communications, so analog, the old analog communications, um, two way radios, you, know, you could buy them at, at stores and stuff like that. It's kind of the walkie talkie type stuff. And, you know, that, that started to go away probably about 10 years ago, but really in the last two, three years, like I still read some articles, like school district has invested to replace all of their analog systems with digital. And the fact is, like, analog is, is it's like the old TV sets. You know, it's like the big TV sets. Um, you, you, can't, you, can't, if, you can't make them work anymore with the new systems. They don't interface with the digital systems. And it's pointless to try to invest and, and do all that when you could just go digital. So analog is just dying out. If it hasn't died out already, it won't be there. So you have digital systems much more reliable. They can work across the police you know, there, there's some planning needs to go in that, but across agencies and things like that. So again, you have a much more robust communication system than you did, um, you know, just two, three years ago. And again, these are the types of systems when cellular towers, for example, are involved, packets of information that are binary, um, like text and things like that, still can typically make it through these systems, you know, even if there's been a substantial disaster event. I think, I think the event that would really cause, um, cause this to fall apart would be if there was like a nuclear detonation. But I mean, <laughs> if there's something like that, I mean, there, are, that would be so, uh, I, I, I mean, just think of the massive, um, depth of response that would happen and planning and, and things like that would have to go into what would happen if there was a um a even a, a limited you know three block nu nuclear explosion in new york or something like that so um and we don't plan we don't plan we don't drill for that that's another thing that comes up you know like kind of stuff like drill you know drill for this well we don't do the birds and turtle drills anymore but yeah we know you know things like that can happen and typically when things like this happen like the world trades no no one planned for for you know the the planes you know to to fly in um you know the the, the buildings were built 
with, at the time, considering the largest aircraft, I think it was a Boeing 707, you know, if it were to hit, um, that it could endure that. But, I mean, you know, you, whatever, we cannot project down down the road. Um, and there's an interesting, there, there's a documentary, I read about this in, in my book. I, I forget what it's called. I watched it yeah, a number of years ago. But the, the, the Navy it was showcasing one of their new vessels. And, um, and... So it was this documentary, and I don't know, but uh, um, what what type of ship frigate, if it was a aircraft carrier, whatever it was. But they were up in the the bridge, and and the bridge of like you know a World War II um, ship was just like packed with like here's here's you know because radar came out like later after the ship was probably built and stuff like that. So like anywhere they could put stuff like it's just jammed with, with all these bulky electronics and things like that and, and retrofit it and retrofit it again. But the new ships being built, they were, they were panning through um, and, it, and there would be wide open spaces on the bridge. And um, one of the people doing, you know, the show or whatever asked the captain like, well, what's the deal? What's the, well, these open spaces here? What, what are they for? And um, the captain said, you know, pause and said that, that's for whatever technology will be created in like 20 years or 30 years, you know, because the, sh the ship had like a life expectancy of 50 years or something like that. So he said that we don't even know what's going to go there, but something will go there, you know, 20 years from now, something will, will go there. Um, and we know how things have got miniaturized and, you know, all on computer screen and stuff like that. But, you know, something develops. This is for the technology that hasn't been developed yet. And that's where, you know, we, we, we get into rescues and I think we, we get linear and we plan to what we know, what we've experienced in, in the past and things like that. And, and I think that we have to also start thinking to the future. I had a very interesting discussion a few podcasts ago uh, with um, Elijah from um, Nerdy by, by Nature. And, uh, and we got a little bit into, um, artificial intelligence and, and just dabbing a little bit in artificial intelligence and maybe rescue what that might look like. We didn't get much into it. We got to go back to that. But, you know, what is AI going to mean? And, and also like rescuers, you know, people, I, I just read an article where these exoskeleton suits that people can wear, which magnify like soldiers magnify their strength by like 20 fold or even like this bionic hand. It's almost like a sleeve you go in where, something that weighs 25 pounds it feels like it's five pounds when you're lifting it up I mean it's just it's it's crazy but those things will be out there and it's gonna be it's gonna be within three to five years folks every fire department every fire department is gonna have a drone and these drones are probably going to be equipped with like you know infrared seeking things and stuff like that so I mean when you fight a fire if it's a fire I mean you're gonna be able to scope like you know exactly where your perimeter is on on the fire let's say it's a wild and you know fire um, you know, if it's a house, it's a barn, you know, you'll be able to, to get up above, see what's there so you can position your, your resources. Um, if it's search and rescue, you know, what that's going to mean for search and rescue, it's, it's going to be phenomenal. So we have these technologies, which are going to be out there. And imagine if you have the, imagine this, I mean, I don't, I don't think this is out there yet, but imagine this, um, if something like 9-11 were to happen today, well, first of all, people are going to have communications, but you could actually have a drone that could be equipped as like a mobile hotspot that you could fly um, over and, and give people, you know, Internet access for a period of time. Or, or the drone could, could have a PA system hooked up to it and communicate information. Um, so, I mean, you're not going to be able to get into a crowd and, and things like that. I mean, it, 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 it is so, I mean, these are the types of things that are going to be rescue. So, um, just, just absolutely crazy. Um, cra crazy in a good way. So, the World Trade Center, too, the, there were regular press conferences that were given throughout that. Um, there was a lot of media coverage. They actually opened up, um, I think it was around 2 o'clock, they opened up some of the subways and some of the transit systems. And, you know, Tower 7 didn't fall until 5, like three hours later. So um, th there was a lot of communication that that started to to uh, come out. That, that's another part that gets, gets you know, mentioned a lot in previous disasters. Is people didn't really know what was going on and, and, you know, or, or we didn't give people enough warning or once something happened, we didn't do evacuation routes or whatever. But, again, that's all getting better, folks. And it's only going to continue to get to be better. So 
again, I, to, to try to put these things together with not, I mean, who would have known like 10 years ago, who would have known that we'd have com commercial drones available and what they'd be able to do and how they might be able to aid and facilitate into um, a rescue. Um, and it, it is, it's just absolutely amazing. So, um, uh, dun, 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 dun. Hey, you know, there, there was something too. Uh, there was just a sidebar fact. I think it's, it's interesting to put out there. Um, communication with President Bush um, following the, the World Trade Center attack, immediately following that, it's very inconsistent. So when he was taken up, um, Air Force One wasn't fully field, and eventually they got to, you know, off at Air Force Base in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, STRATCOM, Strategic Communications, um, and it went all the way down, you know, working with Nora, it went all the way down to, to DEFCON 3, Defense Condition 3. DEFCON, that, that's pretty significant. Um, that, For example, um, with that didn't happen with the Murrah City bombing. That was considered, again, an isolated of, uh, event, a terrorism attack that was isolated. It had concluded. Remember, 9-11, we had attacks again in multiple places. It started around, you know, roughly 9 in the morning, uh, World Trade Center Tower 7, you know, didn't fall until 5. And in this thought, maybe, you know, for about a dozen hours, that there could continue to be some level of attacks because we had, we knew that, um, you know, just there were there were small fishing boat type things and, you know, like Yemen that had been used in the past to, to attack ships, you know, loaded with explosives, you know, where the bridges um, laced with explosives and things like that. So, so very much an ongoing event where, again, we're talking context and situation. The Mura was very much isolated and people could get off uh, too. We're going to get into that in just a, a second, you know, the geography. Um, so, and think about it. Another thing today is, um, you know, so we, we go back, what did we have for, for video of the Mura city bombing? Not much, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't much there also. Um, and then, you know, for, the we have we have you know some some video you know of the September 11th attacks, and I think it was the video that best showed the plane striking uh, the Pentagon was from a gas station, like you know a few blocks away that that was you know just by chance had that in the background, but we have so much more um, today capability for for observing the these these types of things um and just think about it yeah police i mean police wearing cameras so when police are on the scene that they are they are recording things things are being time stamped this is the way that iss 24 7 does stuff right now like with the uh, nfl responding to instance um you know using using all of all of that technology available to them um so yeah we, we're going to have much better time stamping we're going to have much better documentation, real life sharing of information with command centers um, that we couldn't do. I mean, you can literally go out and do a search with a drone and have that video come right back to a command center. You know, let's say a tornado strikes, you know, like a huge tornado, like a Joplin, Missouri type tornado. Um, you know, is, is if it's at night, you can do it with, with infrared. If it's during the day, you can do it in, in, be able to to see quadrants. I mean, you could do these types of things with with helicopters too, um, but you're not going to have helicopters nearly as feasible and as available as you would that you could quickly dispatch um, drones and a number of drones to go out and get closer in. Um, and again, if you know you have areas which could be risky to get into because of gas leaks and and things like that. I mean, if a drone would happen to be lost, that's one thing. You know, if you lose a helicopter with um with a crew that is completely something else so um so um there's also something called an after action review this is very prevalent in significant sentinel events like the MERS um bombing uh, the world trade center attacks um, hurricane katrina um and, and you look it's an after action review and so it was developed in the 1970s. It's more done in the military, but it worked its way over to, to these types of events like Katrina and things like that. Um, and the thing, so you go and you're looking at, you look at all of the data that you can compile forensically from that. And, and this is the other part. People don't realize. So this is where you, you, you also get a lot of conspiracy theory stuff coming in because it's like, well, what data set are you using? 
And okay, well, first of all, like a disaster is is not a planned exercise. You don't have observers out there when you're doing these military drills, like multi nation drills and, and all of these, you know, navy drills or something like that. Well, you know, you have just as many observers out there of the drill as you do participants in the drill. So they're watching everything that's being done. You know, everything is being documented. There's baseline of where people started, where people ended up, how long, you know, it took to get from here to there, what all of the conditions were. All of that's measured. None of that really is is present, and it's not done. It's not very reliable for any of these instances because you, you, these are all unanticipated. You know, um, so you have to go back and you have to interview people and you have to try to take whatever pieces of information you have and, and put them together. Uh, very interesting because I did interview um, a man who rescued someone from a burning vehicle. And I actually did that interview earlier tonight. And this man was an officer in the military, now is a physician's assistant and did this rescue in January of, of 2017. But even as he's remembering this rescue, like he'll pause and, and be like, Here's what I think, or like this person appeared and then they did this and, and this incompleteness. And this is a person who is trained to to be a leader and to jump into action, things like that. So, again, when you go back and you do these after action reviews in, you know, it might be a couple days. It could be a couple weeks later. You're asking people, well, what did you do in, in all of this? A lot of that gets conflated. I mean, it's a very high anxiety time. So if you're asking your rescuers, you might have some of their radio communications, but again, you can look at that, but let's let's say that you have a transcript of a radio communication, but you do not know exactly what they were seeing around them. You don't know the, the context. You don't know what they had been through 10 minutes before that or what resources were there or like, uh, so again, you're so isolated from context and situation. I mean, you can maybe pinpoint where they were at and, and try to, to retroactively, you know, produce what was happening in that setting, but it's a struggle, folks. And here's the other part. If you do an after action review, what do you want to find after you do Sandy, not Sandy Hook, but after um, Katrina? You, you want to place blame. Like th there wasn't a good evacuation plan. People didn't know. There wasn't urgency. We didn't get, you know, enough. Or, or what happens in Florida? You know, what, what's, you know, what's, what's the problem there afterwards? You know, the, the, you know, we didn't get the word out to enough people or, um, you know, uh, the problem is an after action review is almost always assigning fault somewhere. I mean, that uh, you're trying to figure out what went wrong, not what, what went right. So, like, that's very interesting in Lessons of Lower Manhattan because that, that boat rescue of 500,000 people, and, and it wasn't, like, completely without hitches. I mean, there were people initially jumping into the harbor um, and until they started to see, like, that this rescue actually was happening and proceeding. I mean, so it did have definite hiccups um, in it, but for the most part, it was very, very efficient. Um, but yeah, uh, just, just really, just really crazy because these after action reviews, um, nobody wants to be pointed out as like, it was your fault. Like this didn't, this wasn't more effective versus like just analyzing the processes. So just want to, just want to point that out there out. So, um, as we, as we get toward the end here, so we talked about communication and access to information, how from 1995 to present, We've gone from 0.4% of the world having access to the Internet to now 50% of the world, okay? And in the United States, you know, virtually everybody has access, virtually everybody has access to the, the, the Internet. So your access to information is much higher. The systems that are going to provide you that, even in the event of a disaster, are going to be much more robust. So you're going to have access to information where people – have high anxiety where we get into rescues that do not work well is when again rescuers don't have information but the people being rescued don't have information like in 9-11 it's not like i mean if you had to rely on i got to find a tv and watch what's happening well how are you going to do that if you're you're gone the you're gone you know you're you're roaming the streets of lower manhattan going into battery park you know it's it's not like you got tv under your arm you know, that, that you can plug into an outlet somewhere. I mean, it's, it's just you don't have that. But today you do have that access. And for some reason, if you didn't, someone proximal to you is going to have that, that access. So, again, it changes things. 
So as we look at rescues, I think, you know, just what I was talking about, what the deployment is going to be through artificial intelligence, through machine learning, through drones, through those types of equipment, um, and and that is going to have such an impact on on disaster um, rescue and response versus what we saw in the past. So geography, okay, this is this is why I do not like the comparisons of of, of Dunkirk, for example, to the World Trade Center attacks of two thousand one. Um, WTC was on an island. Lower Manhattan is an island, and after the attacks, the you know the arteries were were closed down. People weren't getting in. People were not getting out. Um, and if you were in Lower Manhattan, and I do identify the boroughs in, in in the book, but basically, like that's it. You're not getting past where the World Trade Center is. So you have to move, you know, toward, um, uh, you know, you're moving toward the harbor. You're moving toward Battery Park. I mean, that that that's your way out, or or staying put. Now, if you're staying put, you know, you are. Um, being inundated by ash and, and everything like that. I mean, so so you're really being driven to to the harbor. So it's an island. That's a heck of a lot different rescue, folks. The Murrah building was lo- not located on an island. I mean, it's in Oklahoma City. Smaller, flatter, okay? Um, so to get in and out and to have a, a rescue of people and get people to a safe area, that that's, was relatively quickly established at Oklahoma City. That was not the case in the World Trade Center. And, um, you know, Oklahoma City, once once you get out, I mean, it's not like the, the roads are going to change much. I mean, you're going to have congestion. The World Trade Center, I mean, the harbor can go up and down, you know, a tide, six, eight feet. You can have winds that can change. It can create the waves and, and, and fog. And, you know, if darkness uh, sets in, uh, just the difficulties in trying to navigate the, the harbor and the currents and things like that. So, again, looking at geography, how in the world do you even start a comparison of these two events um, when you have such different geography and how you then have access to the, the resources that you're bringing in to try to, to respond to rescuing people and then also to the attack um, itself? And, you know, the Murray City, uh, you know, building definitely, um, you know, large and significant, but um, fractional compared to the Twin Towers. And then if we also take into consideration ancillary damage and Tower 7 collapse. So I just, I don't like it. I do not like it. So there's a study, and I've got it over here. Ugh. Here's a study. It's called Predicting the Future, and then it says it talks about the American Dunkirk. I'm like, oh, don't even start with that heading. You're not predicting the future. All right. Is it here? Yes, here it is. All right. There's a study. All right. Sorry for kind of moving around here, folks. Ouch. Okay. So uh, 2014 in the Journal of Contingencies and Case Management called Cognitive Correlates of Improvised Behavior and Disaster Response. The cases of the Murrah Building and the World Trade Center is done by um, four university professors, disaster experts. Excellent folks, excellent folks. Um, and, but really, they get, in, they get into the study. So right away, you're, you're looking at these two cases. And, and what's similar, what's different. They're talking about cognition and improvised response and combined efforts and things like that. And, and then they break down into, um, uh, let, me, let me grab it here, like uh, mean rates of improv, uh, improvisation for Oklahoma City and the World Trade Center. And I'm like, I'm looking at this stuff, and I'm a researcher, folks. Like, um, you know, I know qualitative and quantitative. And I'm like, what... Um, I, I don't know what value this brings because you, you do stuff like this, you do stuff like this, and again, um, let's you, you completely overlook that in 95, these people didn't have access to the Internet. They didn't have the, the cellular access either. I mean, it, it wasn't there. They're not getting the information. Um, so when you talk about improvisation and, and things like that, much more prevalent in 2001, 
when you have the the internet, you know, the, the, that's grown from 0.4 percent, you know, to about nine percent. But you know, a large chunk of the U.S. has internet access, and now 50 percent. So it's like, oh, I, I I just nobody talks about it here. The Murrah, you know, the 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 information had to be acquired through analog communications, through TV, through radio, and things like that. Versus you did have in 2001, the ability to acquire that information through cellular devices, um, through like text messages. And if enough, not everybody had to get that, but some people got it, they could share it through the crowd. And then enough people were able to log into the internet and then like text their, their uh, people, friends, family involved in, in the rescue and things like that. I mean, uh, so, but it's not, it's not in the study and improvisation. Yeah. I mean, it makes sense. Improvisation in a rescue because no one anticipated either of these things. And you have to be able to think in the moment and on your feet. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that specifically in my book with this with this man who came upon um, this this scene where there was a vehicle parked off the road, kind of kittywampus, and uh, a, a lady, you know, kind of caught his attention. Something wasn't right, and he came up, and then it was this, this vehicle that, that started on fire. He rescued the person out of it. Um, but I, I, again... To look at these things and not look at the greater context of what was going on. So, um, I think that's from Three Amigos. I'm not sure. Let's let's wrap things up a little or a lot here. So, um, Florida. So a hurricane hits Florida. Heavens, you know, pretty frequently are the threat of a hurricane evacuation. The I-4 is basically your artery in and out of Florida, especially, um, you know, south of Orlando. Um, but so you have Interstate 4. It's mostly flat, but, like, you, a lot of people. So millions of people trying to get on the interstate to evacuate Florida. So what's the problem? Well, the geography there. It, it comes down to it, its infrastructure. Um, it's so when you have a, you, you might have time. You know that this is going to be happening. Like you know, you know, forecast and things like that. It's like two, three, four days ahead of time. So like, evacuate, like get out of here because it's going to be hurricanes going to be hitting. Um, and but you don't have the infrastructure. So that's the context, the infrastructure to handle it. So I mean, they've done some work on the I four. I know because I drove it back in March, but. Um, if you have gridlock, you have people trying to get out, um, that, you know, that is its own context and situation for that safety. And, you know, like Katrina was, was really awkward, you know, too, because people were evacuated out like so far and then the hurricane kept coming inland. So then they'd be evacuated again, evacuate again. I, I know it's for a fact because, uh, I was teaching a college course and I had a student, um, who was taking this course as an online course, um, who lived in, in right outside New Orleans. And she was evacuated numerous times, like inland, and then they say, "Oh, we gotta like keep moving, like the next day, like somewhere else, then somewhere else." And um, so, yeah, just just crazy stuff. So you know how infrastructure is involved, how infrastructure isn't involved, um, and then wildland fires. Okay, people, you get disoriented. The exit, you, you know, wildlands. This is wildlands. You know, it can be hilly. Um, the roads, it's you know. Uh, likely more rural too, so roads aren't as developed as in in you know metro areas. Uh, you can get disoriented um, in you know in these in these road systems too, um, and what the exit routes are because I mean you're not able to necessarily you know you don't know where this fire is progressing, so you have to to really be in tune to what these evacuation routes are. So that that's another thing in geography of wildland fires. Um, and of course, smoke can ob obscure, um, you know, routes and things like that. Uh, Orville Dam up in California, you know, the, the rescue there when they thought the dam was going to fail, I think 700 feet tall. Um, I believe a tall dam in America. So, I mean, if you're, if you're upstream from that, not really, um, as big of a, a crisis issue, of course, um, if you're downstream, yeah, huge issue, and all the way down to possibly Sacramento because it's down, you know, it's in a basin of what that would what that would be. But the the fact was, like, the evacuation routes for that <laughs> actually like crossed the river. Uh, I forget what the name of the river is that the Orville Dam largely discharges um, 
the, the, the reservoir discharges into, but like rescue routes actually crossed the river. And the reality is if the dam fails, these, these bridges will be gone and you won't be able to rescue in a number of these routes anyway. So, so again, geography has, has a ton to do with it. And I'm going to end with an example, um, from the Fukushima, uh, nuclear reactor accident in 2011 following, um, an earthquake. So, uh, a Google engineer, Japanese, and, uh, so grew up in Japan, you know, familiar with, with Japan. It, it, in, in Japan, the streets are not laid out, you know, in the major metro areas. It's very, again, dense population, but it, it's not laid out grid like, like the United States. Um, so anyway, this Japanese, this engineer, you know, this, this, the, the earthquake hits, um, there's disruption in, um, in, uh, in that case, in communication systems to some extent, but then significantly in infrastructure systems. Um, so it's, it's, it's hard to get your, get through the city. So what he does is he would, he was using his cellular phone and connecting to Google maps. And then every time he would get to a point where he couldn't go any further because the infrastructure had failed, he would look and see what his options were per Google Maps. And then he would he would navigate in a different direction. I think it was like 10 hours and he finally got home to his family. Um, but that's a case where a technology that did not exist in 2001 for World Trade Center, definitely not present in 1995, um, was present. And that is only going to become more robust into the future. So that is something that geography becomes less of a barrier. And the fact too, that, you know, you can buy these like personal, um, devices, which will, will ping out into satellites and things like that too. And even, I mean, phones, I mean, that you can, you know, GPS tracking and things like that. Now, granted, like, I understand like this isn't everywhere, but it's getting to be everywhere. And the, you know, lifespan on, on, you know, batteries and, and, and phones and stuff like that. But, um, your ability to bring up, um, maps and to know exactly where you are in relation to other things is, is just absolutely amazing. So the geography, or if you happen to, you know, get, get, you know, lost somewhere that, that you can access and pinpoint where you are again, you know, these systems still are susceptible. They're getting less and less susceptible. And the fact that you could, you know, bring mobile, hot spots out via via drone and and things like that um it's just amazing i will i will have somebody on before long you know uh preston rice i've i've met with him he's works in our county he's one of two commercial drone operators he is going to be on the show talking about um the drone capabilities and we'll, we'll do that relatively soon um so again just in summarizing today so I, I do not believe in studying, um, disasters by looking across, um, comparing disasters because I think the context and situation, these things are so rare too, um, that even like comparing hurricanes hit, you know, New Orleans and things, well, you know, the coastal areas change, like the buffer areas and coastal areas. So someone that might have survived, a hurricane because they were like four miles inland and, you know, there were trees and, and other areas and things like that. But now that had been developed or whatever, that buffer's not there. So the flooding comes in and, and stuff like that. Um, it's just the context and situation is so different from event to event. And then the advances in technology and, and we're at this cusp of how AI is going to interface with safety. Um, and then, um, you know, machine learning mechanics, it, you know, drone and, 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 and so things we don't even know that's going to exist. I talked about this. I talked about this like 10 years ago. It'd be like futuristic speak in some extent, in some sense. So I want to go back at the start. There's a question by Matt and Phil. Um, and he talked about it. How have chief resilience officers adapted their work to various kinds of disaster hazards, um, either following event or in anticipation? So I, I think what's happening is there's a realization. One is, um, a, a, a little bit of, of leaders, leadership, someone stepping up right away 
and, and taking a leadership role um, in a situation can go a long ways. Uh, it settles people down and, and it gets action. And the person I interviewed about this car rescue who pulled someone out um, of a car said people were just kind of standing around. And he said, and again, he was had experience as an officer in the military. He's like, okay, you four people, come here. Like, you're going to take this arm, this arm, this leg, this leg. I'll take the head on one, two, three. We're going to lift and we're going to go. And they did it. You know, and they, they moved this person safely from the vehicle. But I think, I, I think the fact that in 2001, when Commander Loy of the Coast Guard put out the all call saying, any boats out there, come in, help us with the rescue. And he was commended for that. And in Saigon in 75, uh, the Saigon rescue where everybody received, there were three accommodations given out for quick thinking, um, evacuating Saigon. They actually pushed helicopters over the sides of boats um, to, to accommodate for people um, in this rescue and everyone getting, you know, rewarded for quick thinking. Um, the, the problem is, so, so how do chief resiliency officers adapt? One is, it's, it's saying, you make these decisions, and we have your back, okay? And I think that allows people to make decisions and things to get rolling. Now, the hiccup we saw in this, though, and that that was like with Sully, okay? And the miracle on Hudson, you know, Sully lands the plane. What happens? The airlines, like, after a little while, they're like, ooh, like, you know, you didn't quite follow protocol, which was to go through like this and, and, and this. And, and we really don't know if he had a land on Hudson. Like, you probably could have got back. And other professionals, you know, experts are saying, no, he completely did the right thing. And it's like in the moment, like you have to make decisions in the moment. And you can't flip chart and you can't go through these decision tree hierarchies. And I think he had enough positive, you know, obviously media and, and people behind him where the airline was not going to pursue that any further. But that really had an odd feel to it. Um considering, you know, that, that that was validated from early on um, by by a number of experts and that was a successful rescue. But that takes away it, the discretion. I mean, if you're if you're a pilot right now, um, I think you, you're probably a little hesitant on your discretion. So how have chief resilience officers adapted? I think encouraging people to, to use discretion and to validate it because it was validated at the World Trade Center. And it needs to be validated in the future that if if you – and when I debrief critical instant events, I typically see that this is happening. People are being validated saying, in the context and situation, you act in the best interest of, of that – of the person or persons that you are trying to benefit, trying to save um, or to help. Uh, and, of course, you know, with, with considering your own personal safety in that. So I think I think that's definitely there. Um, and this, there is much more talk of improvisation, of teaching people situational awareness and sense making, being aware of what's happening around you, having this hyper vigilance of what's happening around you. Um, now with that said, so that's, that's the, you know, that's how things are being adapted. Um, various kinds of disasters and hazards. It, it, that's one of those things, too, is you, you can only contingency plan so far, and I think people realize that. I remember working with schools five years ago who would have contingency plans for 30 or 40 things. Like, well, there was a school in California that had a contingency plan. What if an airplane falls on our school? They were not located anywhere near an airport, okay? What if an airplane falls on our school? What do we do? And it's like, don't don't put that in. I mean, what if a flying saucer comes down and shoots a few laser beams at your school? I mean... I don't mean to to poke fun at that, but you you take what your high priority, your highest priorities are going to be, which most people wrongly identify. But um, you know, so if you're in California, earthquake, yeah, I mean, could be could be a wildfire. Um, you know, everyone has to anticipate the possibility of of an intruder. But some of these other things, you know, come on, um, and so. The other part that's coming into play, people are getting more um, adept at recognizing the mental health of responders, where if you had a, boy, I read this somewhere, um, it, it was it was a firehouse, and this wasn't too long ago, I don't know if 
this is like 10 years ago or whatever, but there was like a cat that was always kind of wandering around the outside of the firehouse. It was in a bigger metro area, so they had a lot of calls. And, uh, it, it, and they just adopted the cat into this firehouse. And um, anyway, they said, you know, the cat had such a therapeutic effect. And we know today, and this is one of the things, again, that I, that I do, along with other people who are trained to do this, uh, I, I do this as an extension of the county sheriff's department. Um, but to help people debrief, your your responders help them debrief on the event and to pay attention to the mental health and emotional well-being. So that's changed because otherwise it was pretty much like, you know, this was your job, you would respond, and there really wasn't a debriefing that would be a debriefing focused on how are you doing how are you handling this? What, what are you doing at home? What are you doing that's not work-related? Um, how are you sleeping? Um, tell us about things you're doing with other people, stuff like that, those type of questions. They're just focused on on, on that. Um, so that's different. So that's, that's where those things, I think, have adapted in that you are having these debriefings. Now, the challenge is we're also seeing this, this uptick in number of responses. Even in my community that I live in, the fire department had a record number of responses uh, for this year already. And the responses are, you know, you're having many more responses because of drug overdoses, um, domestic issues, things like that. Um, and not necessarily traditional responses, you know, which might be car accidents, um, fires, things like that. But, but you're having more. And this is, this is all around. And it's, if you have volunteers, uh, you need to be very aware of the toll that that's taking on. I mean, if you have a fire department that for years was, you know, a volunteer fire department that was responding to maybe, you know, 40 or 50 calls a year, and now they're responding to 300 calls a year, that's significantly different. Um, and, and I guess coming in, the last part of this is we know that all call – events um, create just nightmares for staging. And people are, 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 are understanding that for large-scale events, meaning um, the Sick Temple shooting in Oakville, Wisconsin, which happened, oh, maybe 10 years ago, maybe not even that long. I think it was maybe 10 years ago, though. Um, literally, you know, it involved the shooter at the at the, the temple, and it had concluded, and it was strange because there were calls going back to I don't know is it India, where where a lot of the the people um, had had migrated to the United States um, who were attending the Sikh temple. So so these calls would go to India from family members of seeing what was happening. They would call them back to like first responders and, and saying like we we just heard this is happening and, and actually it already concluded. It's just this really this really weird loop of communication. But but um, an all call goes out saying, you know, there's the shooting or if like there's a school shooting, off duty officers, on duty officers, different agencies respond. So you can have literally four or five hundred people respond, which isn't over telling this. It actually happens. Like they'll fill up entire parking lots. So trying to stage this becomes really hard. And who is really in charge? Um and making sure that, that that gets established pretty quick and then identifying how to best use those resources. And then when they're not needed, the event has wrapped up, that those those people are are gone. Um, that, you know, they, they, you know, we don't we don't need you. We don't it's not that we don't appreciate, but we don't need you. And there was a lot of lingering after the sick temple of people, you know, just staying and this, this thing of who's really in charge. So I think that's gotten much better in the last few years. Um, so yeah, that, that's where I think the chief resilience off. I never really heard that, that term before, honestly, Matt and Phil, to be honest with you, the chief resilience it's, it's probably, I'm not saying it's not a term. I just, I probably know it by something else. Um, so, but yeah, I, I think an anticipation comes in of telling people, use your discretion, act on your tacit knowledge. Um, and we've got your back if you're acting in the best interest of, of people. Um, and also, you know, you're going to encounter situations and contexts that, that are going to be, there's no way we can prepare for those. And, and we have no idea what those will be like at any moment. I mean, 
what if something happens and it's during, you know, heavy rains or cold weather or whatever. You know, September 11th, for example, would have been really significantly different if that would have happened in November on a cold day in choppy harbor, you know, conditions. So, um, and again, I think the biggest, the biggest thing afterwards is the fact that we are doing debriefing now of people and asking um, very specifically with that mental health component. It's not, it's not a briefing of saying, tell me the first thing that happened, second, third, fourth. You kind of go through that, but it's not a forensic analysis investigation of the event. That's not going on. It is there to say, what did you feel coming into this? What do you feel now? And, you know, what's your support network? Because, um, you know, there, there is a high burnout rate. There's depression. There's, there's suicide. Um, you know, high levels of divorce in responders. And, and those are things I think that are being recognized. Um, I, I talked about it in an earlier podcast, but also, well, post-traumatic stress dis- disorder, which, um, President, uh, um, President Bush, um, George uh, W. Bush, um, is working to have that reclassified as post-traumatic stress injury. Um, He's really done a lot of wonderful, wonderful work uh, with with military vets. Um, he has a, he has a foundation for that. But anyway, um, you know, and I, I talked about it too in that in a podcast uh, just recently of World War II. Prior to World War II, I mean, World War II and prior, we are terms of like shell shock or battle fatigue. And now, you know, it, it was it was seen as an in person weakness. Like if you can handle it. It's because you weren't screened out. And it's the same thing, you know, like with, with very, very proud in, in um, you know, fire departments, in um, police, you know, typically are going to be your responders to this EMS, um, healthcare professionals, emergency, you know, workers, hospitals. Um, but now, again, looking at the mental health side of that and making sure to have have some intervention it's not totally there yet this is this is new this is like happening now um i actually went through my first mental health first aid training um as as a professional educator uh last year and um i'm 45 and i've been doing this 20 years it's the first time but that's because it's being recognized now and it's becoming pretty standard in, in schools to, to do this because of um, it's not only if an intruder situation happens at a school, which is really rare, like a school shooting once per Cornell, Cornell University study, once every 13,300 years in any particular school. But it's a thing like if you are working in a school, too, and, and, and there could be a bomb threat that's called in or even like a, a threat made against the school or it's a neighboring school or, you know, something like that. It's because, like, you're in that industry, um, that you're in that field, you get those ancillary feeling, the ancillary anxiety. So needing to talk about that. Plus, you know, things, you know, happen, you know, too in schools. So, uh, folks, that is it for today. Again, why we can't compare disasters such as the World Trade Center, a Mura building bombing, um, Hurricane Katrina, and more. I hope this has been helpful. I always appreciate uh, sharing this information with you. Again, uh, consider subscribing to the show. Uh, it is on SoundCloud. It is on Apple Podcasts. You cannot miss the orange, yellow, bright, new, awesome uh, logo, the brand for, for the Safety Doc um, on Stitcher, uh, on Blueberry. It is it is out there. And then on YouTube, I think I've got a, I've got a cat here. But um on, on YouTube, go in and check it out. You can watch it. Some people like to watch it, but yeah, check it, check it out. And you can follow me at, uh, safety PhD at safety PhD on Twitter. We are up to 975 followers, which is awesome. I thank all of you. Um, and, and I mean, in, in your genuine followers, I go in like, and if I'm being followed by someone who's trying to, I can sell you 10,000 Twitter followers and whatever. I'm like, nope, report a spam and block. Um, it is kind of funny because, like, I, I do have, like, in my, in my SoundCloud following, <laughs> you know, SoundCloud is a big base for musicians. So I do have, like, a lot of musicians who will follow the, the show. So they're not really – I have podcasters, too, but then, you know, like, a lot of musicians and rappers and, and things like that who, who will be follow. And I'm, like, not really sure they're understanding the, the genre. But um, 
But yeah, please, please consider following the show. And Matt and Phil, thank you so much for getting the question to me. And you can email me, um, the safety doc at gmail.com. I mean, all that stuff's pretty easy to find once you just go to, um, on Twitter at safety PhD, you can get in and then find, you know, see it. It, it is, um, um, uh, you can get in there and, and, and get information on how to contact me, get to the website and so forth. Um, but yeah, I, I love answering questions. Um, I'm glad to be on shows. I'm going to be a guest on a, a show tomorrow. Um, and I do, I am, uh, I did participate as a guest on another show, the wait, what if podcast, uh, produced by Kevin Sullivan. And that will be out this week also. So, uh, always uh, interested uh, to, to participate as a guest. Um, and if you ever see me at the library at a book sale, please say, Dave, look through that book. Um, is that a book that you might have donated and are you repurchasing it? So I cannot believe I did that. If you have a cure for Japanese beetles, please let me know. I do have Joe the Bug Guy stopping over tomorrow to treat my maple in the front. And hope that that thing holds on. Um, and my main bathroom renovation is almost done. Yay! Uh, very tedious uh, process. Great work. But uh, we had the whole thing tiled. So it looks awesome. Someone said it kind of looks like a like a spa. But it's very tedious work. And then as soon as that one's done, number the second bathroom um, gets gutted out. And, and then hopefully that'll be it for a while. Everybody, uh, take it, take care of yourselves um, and enjoy here as we, we hit this hot stretch of summer. Make sure to take care of yourselves. Uh, you know, the stay hydrated, stay safe, stay aware, uh, aware of what's going on. A lot of a lot of bikers. I'm out there too. Bikers, as in like pedal bike, um, and and just really aware of your environment and, and enjoy it. Thank you very much. I appreciate you as an audience substantially for supporting this podcast.